Welcome. This is a video I made to show you how I installed a working SunOS installation, both SunOS 3.2 and SunOS 2.0 on an emulator. So I will show you how I installed FreeBSD. On top of that, how I installed the machine emulator, TME, and how I use that to install SunOS. TME runs on uh, several operating systems, and my favorite operating system happens to be FreeBSD. It's a rock solid, uh, really great operating system. So I start by going to freebsd.org and download the current release, which at the time of recording is FreeBSD 12. And I download the AMD boot only ISO image, and I can use that uh, to install a FreeBSD system. I can also install this on bare hardware, of course, but in this case I am on a Macintosh system, an Apple system, um, running macOS, and I've installed Parallels, and in Parallels I can emulate a system and install FreeBSD on top of there. So the first part of this video will be just a basic FreeBSD installation, and then we will move on to installing TME and installing patches for TME, so it will run SunOS. TME is, a, is an emulator for a Sun system. It can emulate different types of Suns. It was created by Matt Fredette, who did a wonderful job. And um, Matt is a, a contributor to NetBSD. So TME was also originally also designed for NetBSD. Um, and um, it was also an emulator built to, in, to run NetBSD on the emulated Sun. Right, so we've just booted the install uh, ISO image, and I'll make it a bit bigger. It uh, boots the kernel and uh, starts the installation procedure. So in the uh, parallels um, environment, I, I chose just the default value. So it has a default uh, uh, hard disk, and everything is default. So here in the installer, I choose to install. And actually, we can uh, suffice with defaults here for most of the settings as well. So I, I choose a host name. But here, on this screen, I choose something non-default, uh, and that is to include the ports uh, collection. So the rest is all default. Uh, I uh, use DHCP for the interface. In this case, I select no for IP version 6, but if you like, you can choose that as well. I uh, use the uh, guided disk setup, use the entire disk. This is all defaults. And we commit. And it will now start to download all the binaries from the, from the server, from the internet, and uh, um, put them on the hard disk. Uh, this takes quite some while, and I've sped this up by cutting away um, some of this process. So here we see the, um, the, the files have been downloaded, they are being checked, and then they are being extracted to the hard disk. Especially the ports directory will take some, some while because those are 25,000 plus small files. So there are tens of th thousands of ports available uh, of um, uh, programs you can add to FreeBSD. So it asks for a root password. It asks me to set a region. I happen to be in the Netherlands, so I choose the Netherlands. And we chose the, choose the defaults here as well. And I'll add a, a user to the system. You could name your user Sun or anything else you like. I am making the user I always have myself. And I invite myself to the group wheel. And that is to make it possible for me to do an SU to root. Also, I give myself the TC shell because that's what I like. I'm a BSD kind of guy. And that is it. We now have a FreeBSD system. I, I do here a final check, but I haven't changed anything. I haven't changed anything. 
we reboot and we'll have a working FreeBSD 12 host with a user, in this case called Walter. So because I would like to run TME in a graphics mode, I am going to have to install X, the X window system. And on FreeBSD, there are two ways of installing software, actually three, you can of course always compile from source, but on FreeBSD you also have packages, which are binary, and you have ports. Packages are really fast and easy to install, but you cannot change the settings. So if you want special settings for a package, that's not possible. You need to install the port. Ports are compiled from source. As you can see, I type in pkg install xorg, which installs the X window system. And this uses packages. So it's downloading binary uh, programs. And this is sped up a little bit. It's, uh, it sees that x.org has a lot of dependencies. So these packages are being fetched as well and being installed as well. First they are um, fetched from the internet and then they are installed. Now I also like FreeBSD very much because the uh, information, the documentation is very good. You can get man pages for anything. Um, and there's also a handbook on the internet. Now apart from x.org, I am also installing xfce4, which is a window manager. You can use another one if you like. Uh, XF, uh, CFV4 is, is uh, lightweight, XFC4. And I'm checking the handbook to see what I need to do to get X running. This is not something I do every day. There we see I should set dbus enable to yes in rc.conf and I need to put some information in my .x init rc file. So if I type start x, it will um, run the correct window manager. It would have been easier to do just copy paste. So for the Unix geeks, it took me three seconds to realize that pressing tab doesn't work if you're inside a um, string. There will be some more small errors that I made along the way. So I type start X to start the X environment. It doesn't work and it tells me that I it couldn't start dbus. So um, that's the line on the left, middle left, dbus enable equals yes should be put into the rc.com file, which is the main configuration file on FreeBSD that tells you what services are started. And so by typing servers dbus start, I can start the server now because just putting it in the rc.conf, I want to make sure that it starts during system boot. But I want to start it now as well. So the service is starting. Of course, I don't run x as root, but as Walter. So I type start x again. And we have a working FreeBSD system with a graphical windows environment. So now we can move on and try to install the machine emulator. Now actually first I will install a web browser and I will point you to some websites that contain information that you need to install SunOS and TME. 
I can type su since I'm in group wheel. And in slash user slash ports, we have the um, ports directory, the ports collection. And under the subdirectory emulators, we got TME. So I type make and it will find a lot of dependencies. I just use the default for any question I see. And at a certain point in time, when it's done building all the dependencies and installing them, it goes to building TME. And here I press Ctrl C because we need to apply the patches for, C for TME. If you were too late and TME was already installed or was already built, no problem. So I just type make in the uh, emulator's TME directory. It builds TME, but that's the unpatched version. So let me first build a web browser so I can fetch the patches that I need for TME. The patches make it possible to install SunOS 3.2 at least on the emulator when emulating a Sun 2 slash 120. But it's still a bit fidgety, so I wasn't able to install SunOS 2.0 for instance. So there's the heeltoe.com webpage of a guy called Brett, who also did uh, some wonderful work documenting the boot, boot uh, the installation process for the old SunOS versions, but also he built these patches for TME. So this is a div file, which I will save. And now I can use the patch command to apply the diffs. Actually, it gives me a warning that I'm in the uh, I'm apparently in the wrong directory. So I need to do it from the work directory, which is the directory in which the, the ports are being extracted and built. So the patches seem to have worked. So we go up a directory and type make again to make TME or make it again if you were too late in composing it before, and now with the patches. Make will only make it in the work directory, and when we want to install it on our system in user local bin, we then need to type make install. But while that is busy, let us go to the page with SunOS releases. This contains a few versions of SunOS for the Sun 2 architecture. Not all are installable. For instance, 4.0.3 is an upgrade. So you can install 4.0 directly from tape, but not 4.0.3. We are going to download them all, and I will show you how to install 3.2 and 2.0. So I'll make a TME directory in my, in my home there, where we will put the tape images, the hard disk images, and all the rest. So this is also sped up a little bit. We'll download all the uh, different versions. There are more, more versions floating around on the internet. So you will be able to find, for instance, version 1.1 as well. And the 2.2 upgrade is also available. Now for the rest, we will be using the recipe for booting SunOS, which lists the commands to use to get the SunOS release from the tape to the disk. And SunOS 2.0, I can get to work directly, but 3.2 did work. So we are going to use the recipe for SunOS 3.2 to get that onto a hard drive, a virtual hard drive. And once you have the virtual hard drive, you can use that in combination with Excusi 2 SD a card uh, where you put the image on an SD card um, or you can copy it to a real drive using the DD command 
and um, thus create a bootable hard disk. So for TME, we go to the TME page because we need to set up TME as well. So we're going to the page from net for that getting the software we've already done. Now the emulator can also do TCP IP uh, with the emulated Ethernet card, but that's something I haven't tried out myself. I have a real 2120 that I use instead of the emulator. I only use the emulator to get the OS onto the disk. So here you can see that you need to have a configuration file, copy the Sun2 Multibus machine description file. So somehow I, I would assume um, the TME installation would have put that somewhere in user local share examples, but it wasn't there. So I'm just taking it from the work directory. So use the find command to see where it is. That's the um, configuration file so I copy that to my son 2 as per the instructions on the left and then I also need the sun boot ROMs sun 2 multi ref r dot bin and that's some proprietary stuff and it is also available as abandonware on this website Revision R is the latest revision that's available for the Sun 2 120. The Sun stores some system information such as the model and the Ethernet address in its uh, ID prom. So there's a command that will create that for you, but the compilation of TME is still working, so the command is not there yet. Ah, the compilation has just ended, so we can type make install to push the binaries to the correct position. And now we can use all the TME commands. And there's a command TME sun ID prompt to create a new ID prompt file. System can't find it immediately. I need to type rehash so it rereads and hashes the contents of the um, binary directories. And I use the command that's shown on the left to create an ID prompt file with a random MAC address. I started with 8020 because that's what the older sons all use. That was uh, the uh, vendor uh, ID for the sun. So there's a few more files I need the sun keyboards file and my sun macros.txt that I will copy. And there we are. Now the only thing left to do is create a hard disk. And there's a dd command uh, given there that will create, create a hard disk. But I'm going to create one with a specific size. So you can choose whatever size you like. But because I want to be able to dd it to a physical, real physical hard drive, uh, I'm choosing the Micropolis 1355. So I'm trying to figure out how big that exactly is. Also, I know that the Macropolis 1355 is one of the drives that is known to the SunOS 3.2 installer, which makes it easier to format the drive because it, it knows the size of the drive. If I were to use a random size, I would need to tell the format program exactly how many cylinders, heads, etc. there are. Here I can just use the, the internet and look up, there's uh, 1024 cylinders, there's uh, 36 uh, sectors per track. There are eight tracks per cylinder, also known as heads. And each sector is 512 bytes, giving me a total of, um, well, the drive is, is called a 150 megabyte drive, which is close to that number. So we use the DD command to actually copy dev0 to the file, but we only copy one byte. Um, uh, I, I made a mistake here, so I control C it out of it, do it again. We only are going to copy one byte, so the block size is one, the 
count is one, copy one byte. You see the seek address is one less than the length that I want to have. And now we have a file that is actually a big gap with one zero byte at the far end. So at this time on disk, it takes up only one byte, but we can just write in it and it will fill up the hole. Now the my son 2 file, that's the main configuration file. So let's look at that. I will change the RAM size from four to seven megabytes, which is the, the maximum. If you have a uh, black and white frame buffer, which is emulated as well. So seven is the, is the maximum. All these settings we leave as is. This is the, these are settings about the console, the, all the devices, but we need to change the disk. Here it says that there is a disk zero uh, and it points to a file and I'll point it to the Micropolis 1355 uh, image that I just created. Now that should be enough to run the emulator. So here we have the Micropolis. We have all the other files. We have the configuration file. Now let's untar the 3.2 boot tapes. And because I'm lazy, I give it a shorter name. And now what we can do is we can use a command either in the configuration file, or we can run that command from the TME shell. We can connect these files to a tape. So tapes consist of several files and the command is command tape zero load and then a bunch of files and those will become files on the virtual tape. So I've seen that on tape one there are 10 files so I give the command to load all of those 10, 10 files as tape zero and I can also include the command main bus power up that will be executed when I start the shell so then the system will automatically boot up power up. So let's start the emulator with my newly created configuration file and we see that indeed it boots a working Sun 2 slash 120. I see we have ROM revision R which we installed. It has 7 megabytes of memory and it can't boot from the SD drive because there's nothing installed there yet. So we are going back to the heel toe list with the um, instructions and we see that we need to boot from the tape first file is a bootloader and then we tell it to boot from the third file ST003 which is the format program. We select SCSI number four, we select address 80,000 that you can also find by the way in the configuration file, target zero unit zero, those are the SCSI ID and we specify drive zero micropolis 1355. So because we chose a micropolis it's easy we can just type disk zero and do label and it knows exactly how to label this disk. We quit, we are back in the bootloader. We type in to boot uh, file number four, which is the standalone copy program, which can copy data. We copy from file five, which is the, the, VM, uh, the, the Unix um, program. We copy it to the partition one of the hard disk, which is the swap device. We boot from SD001 VM Unix AS, which now boots from hard disk. And this is the installation program. It asks for the root device. We type in SD0 star. Don't forget the asterisk at the end. It's, it's really needed. And we can now use NuFS to um, put a file system on the root and the user uh, uh, partitions, uh, the partitions uh, 0A and 0G. So this is all written down on the left as well. Now at this stage we have a disk with on the swap partition uh, the, the mini Unix and we also have new invest file systems. So at this stage I'm going to copy the disk, the virtual disk, uh, so we can reuse that and we have some uh, point to go back to in the future. Now I'm making a ST0 device so we can use the tape and uh, with the STTY erase command I can make sure that the backspace is actually working. I'm mounting the root directory and now the next thing to do is to put the files from the boot tapes onto the disk. And those files are just tar images 
that I untar onto this disk. So I do a fast search forward six, which means I'm now positioned at the seventh file on disk, it's a tar file, and I use the tar command. And what's important is that I do a tar x v p f, and that p is not on the instructions on the left, but the p is actually needed to set the permissions correctly. If you don't include the P, every file will become world readable and the system will be work, will work, but it will be very insecure. Well, it will be very insecure anyhow, but it will not be as it was meant to be. So let's look at the files. So we see uh, that six, seven, eight, and nine are tar files, and I'm just making sure to see where these files need to go. So this looks like it is um, going to the root as well. So some tar files go to the root and some tar files go to user. If you have a little experience with uh, Unix, you probably know which is which. Now in the dev directory of the newly created disk, there is a make dev file that can be used to create the device entries. And you need to run this to make the devices because that is part normally of the installation process. Somehow it doesn't create the PTY0 and I'm not sure why. So we'll do that later by hand. Those are only needed, those are pseudo terminals and you will need those if you log in over the network or if you run the windowing system. Something else that we don't get from untarring the tapes is an fstep file containing information about what to mount during boot time. So I will need to, I will need to populate that by hand and we will boot uh, 0a on slash and 0g on slash user. They're both 4.2, BSD 4.2 file systems. And this is also explained on the left. I use 1.2 for the letter line, but 1.1 one, one is fine as well. And I am moving ipbind to ypbind.org, also as indicated on the left. If you don't, uh, the system will work, but when you log in as, as root, it will try to contact the Yellow Pages server. And if you don't have one, it will just wait and wait and wait, and you can't interrupt that. So now I'm going to the user directory and untar some more stuff because I type in the same commands time after time. Let's make it into a small shell script. Let's see which files we had, it was file nine, so we need to fast forward eight positions. Now, that's a mistake because this one was supposed to go in the root and not in slash user. So at this point, I could just take the uh, empty image again, run uh, boot from SD001 again, and uh, retrace my steps. But I'll just try and uh, fix it. So we're now entering the tape to the correct position. And now I'm going to remove where I untied it before. But as you can see, I make a mistake. I'm typing slash user instead of slash a slash user. So I'm now deleting all kinds of stuff in my, 
Munich uh, in my um, RAM disk. Luckily, it still keeps on working. But yeah, you know, I've been working with Unix so many years and still I should, every time you type rm as root, you should wait a few seconds before you press enter, but oh well. Now we need to go to take two, because we are done with take one. So I'll put that command in the configuration file as well. Just so I have it documented somewhere and I can easily copy paste it. So I'm only going to um, use files three through six because those are the path files. The other ones are just containing text about what kind of tape it is. So this command unloads the tape and now I lo load new files on the same tape drive. So I'm in the wrong directory, now I'm in the correct user, the mounted one from NT0G. So I need to remove all the stuff here. And we'll un untar the files that are in that are on tape two. Not all of these are really needed. Some are additional software. But since we have the tapes anyhow, let's just make it a full system. The hard disk is big enough. It's 150 megabytes. That was quite large for the time already. At least for a SCSI disk. This error signifies that there is no tape or an empty, there is no file on tape. And then the last tape, tape three. Let's check again which of those files are the actual tar files, which is number three to 14. Now the copy paste doesn't really do what I wanted to do. Got how many files? Nope, fourteen is the last one. And forgot to unload. And unfortunately, there is no way to get your old command back.
All right, tape three is in. Those are also files that need to go to the user directory. We'll use our little script with arguments zero up to 13 to extract them all. Let's see, we get the Fortran compiler. And that was the last of them. All right, we have a fourth tape with five more SAW files. So again, we're going to change the tape. We need to unload it and load the next one, tape four. Again, I skip files one and two, which are just text files explaining what kind of tape they are and a bootloader. This video is sped up a little bit. And that's all. We have extracted all four tapes. So we can unmount the real disk, well, the real virtual disk. And we should be able to boot into the just installed system. And the only thing we need to do next is to install the missing devices. Well, I just press Ctrl C to get out. I don't know if there's any other command that will do so. Let's comment out the tapes because we don't need them anymore. And if we now start it, it will run the system with a disk without any tape present. So this looks promising. It is booting from SD0. The kernel starts. SunOS 4.2 release 3.2. It's doing the FSCK. And now this is interesting, it hangs. And if you wait long enough, you will get YP errors. And so what happened is that I remember that I renamed YP bind to ypbind.org. Well, I later untarred a file containing ypbind onto the same location. So we have an Etsy ypbind. And what I'm doing now is I'm commenting the disk command. So I want to start the emulator without the disk being present. Because if there is no way uh, that I know of that I can interrupt the boot process and boot single user mode. So what I'm doing is I disconnect the disk. I, I tape, take out the disk statement from the configuration file, start the emulator so it doesn't have a disk. It complains about it. And when I press any key to quit, it goes into the boot prompt. 
Now I can manually attach the disk and boot from it using the boot command that I choose. So I could boot single user mode from the disk. But just for the sake of it, I'm going to load a tape bootloader, boot from tape. And I'm booting the uh, installation program that's still present on the swap partition. Now I did a somewhat ungraceful shutdown, but let's see what happens. We see here that YP bind was reinstalled after I had renamed it. So let's get rid, rid of the new installation. And let's see if we can now log in. Now, because the login was not responding, I, as I said, ungracefully shut down the system. So this means that we have inconsistencies in the file system. So if I were really picky, I would probably spend the extra 20 minutes to do the whole process again to be sure that I have a really clean, stable system with no files that are damaged in any way. Well, the FSUK output doesn't look that problematic. So we now press Ctrl D to boot multi-user. And we can log in as root. And there we have a working SunOS 3.2 booting from the virtual disk. Now, the PTY uh, devices, they weren't made yet. So I don't know why this make dev doesn't work with PTY0. It also doesn't work if I specifically start it with SH. In the great BSD fashion, the SunOS 3.2 installation has a default shell of C, C shell, also for root. And because it's easier to use programs like less, I will take a look at the make dev program by untowering it from the source tape and looking at it on the FreeBSD system instead of on the Sun. We'll extract that one file from the tape and take a look at what MakeDev is doing to create those pseudo terminals. So let's write a little script to make them. And let's speed up the process a little bit. So with a little bit of VI and yeah, some regular expressions, this is, can be done quite quickly. So now we have the pseudo terminals. And now what's interesting is there is a program called Sun Tools, which st starts the graphical environment and it says not found. It doesn't mean that Sun Tools cannot be found or says no such file or directory. What the problem is, is that it tries to open uh, slash dev slash win devices and those don't exist yet. And the make dev program also is not able to create the wind devices. So let's do that by hand as well. So here they are, and let's try Sun tool. 
on tools. And there we have the graphical user environment running on our Sun 2 120 running Sun OS 3.2. Let's hold the system and quit the uh, emulator. And now we have a disk that we know is good. So this can be put on a SCSI 2 SD, SD card for instance, or a real White Populous 1355 disk. So now what I'm going to show you is how I can install other SunOS versions, bootstrapping from this one Micropolis disk holding SunOS 3.2. So I'll untar the SunOS 2 tapes. And what I'm going to do is change the configuration file for TME. Uh, in the disk section, first of all, I'll, I'll load the uh, SunOS 2 tape. So we have 10, 3, and 14 files. Let's uh, load the first tape automatically. And now we have to change the disk. So it's still booting from the SunOS uh, 3.2 disk. But we can actually copy those two lines and create a second disk. So we have two disks at the same time. So we have SD1 also connected to SCSI bus 0. And SD1 is, is a disk 1 which is connected, can be connected to a different file. So disk 0 is our 3.2, and we'll create a new file, which will be the SunOS 2.0 disk. So for the SunOS 2.0 disk, we can just use the empty disk that we created before. So we already have a disk with the file system layout on there. So we should be able, well actually, yeah, we should be able to just mount the directory and untar the stuff on there. So you see that a, an SD0 and an SD2 have been detected. We've booted off SD0, which is the 3.2 release that we made. We'll have to make an SD2. Apparently it already existed. That's no problem. So we can mount SD2A and SD2G on the user later on.
So the tar files start with number six. There are four tar archives on this tape. Six is definitely in the root and seven goes to user. Again, we create a little helper script. Don't forget to include the P for the permissions. We're skipping five, which means we start with file six. Now we have the kernel and the standard stuff. We can now mount the user directory onto the fresh user. And here we can untar the other three files in this archive. So those are seven, eight, and nine. So we need to skip six, seven, and eight. Right, so that was tape number one. The two only has one tar archive. So we can do that by hand, loading that just the one file. And the last tape has 12 tar archives, tape archives. Let's check if the tar has ended, not yet. There we are. And take three is loaded. We're done untaring. Now again, we need to do a few more things. Make the devices and make an F step, F step file 
and make sure that YP bind doesn't get in the way. It's the same steps as with uh, Sonobus 3.2. And once more, building the pseudo TTYs doesn't work by calling the make dev script. Now I should have copied the, um, the little helper scripts that I made onto the original 3.2 disk, so I could use them now. This is just a repeat of the steps that we've done before um, using the FreeBSD system to easily navigate through the MEGDA file, figuring out how the um, device nodes are being made, put it into a little shell script, and run that. So we'll speed that up as well. You saw some errors, that was because my first script had a small typo and some devices were greater than not all. And I cut that out of the movie. So we've untarred everything, we've created the Everstep file, we've uh, moved YP bind, and we've created the devices, so that should be all. And now we can remove our working disk and um, use the newly created SunOS 2.0 disk and see if we can boot from it. So we see the kernel gets loaded, but then we get hit messages, debug messages in TME shell, which means something happens that's not supposed to happen. But trust me, if you take this image and put it in SCSI 2 SD and run it on a real system, it does work. So this is a way to actually make a SunOS 2.0 install. Thank you.